Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Tom Hanks and John Hanks. John Horn is a lot taller in real life than he sounds on the radio. <laughs> Here we are. Hey John, good to talk to you again. You, and I, have, you and I have bumped heads a couple of times. Right? We have. We have in uh, various places, so good to see you again. Good to see you. Tell us where we are. Okay, let me, okay. Um, let's just jump into it. Everybody was like, Tom, well, tell us what your day job as a movie star. Oh, what is it that prompted you to write a novel? <laughs> Uh, the reason is, is because I've never, I don't need it, this is not product placement, I've never, uh, I've never, uh, uh, making, making movies is as fascinating as any long-term creative endeavor, and it has the same amount of plot, uh, twists and turns and personalities as, say, building a bridge across the, the Ohio River, or, or any sort of, like, big, massive undertaking that can only be done with a huge amount of people all uh, collaborating on the same project. And oftentimes movies go south because it turns out not everybody is collaborating on the same. Project. <laughs> um, and I wanted to capture that uh, that the thing that uh, my uh, my uh, editor said. He says nothing's more interesting than hearing the, the people tell about what they do and how they came to do it and why they do it. So that that's in there. And in there I hope <clears throat> is apocryphal stories that are the equal to this. So let me kick this off right now with a motion picture story about the making of not one, but two modern motion picture masterpieces experienced by yours truly. And by the way, when I mention a title of one of my films, you have to jump in with the applause just like that. <laughs> I do not want there to be a lag or something like that. <laughs> We're not editing this, and it's got to be it's got to be Vox Populi. Oh, tell us more about that one, Tom. So it has to be that, okay? Um, we were I was making a movie with Nick, uh, Mike Nichols called Charlie Wilson's War. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, we had shot it. We had shot in the mountains of Morocco, and we needed some extra footage. So there's a place, very famous place out. It's called Magic Mesa. It's out. It's out on the road to the uh, to Lancaster and Bear Blossom Highway. And it's a, you have to go way up there, and you find it's a big flat place where they used to uh, test, believe it or not, World War II airplanes. Uh, but it's a huge flat place, and we turned that into essentially a refugee camp during the war, uh, the war between the Soviet Union and. and uh, Afghanistan, all sorts of Afghanis came down from communities all over California. And it was also a Red Cross hospital, so we had to have a number of cast people that were, for example, amputees, missing limbs. And there is actually an active casting community of amputee actors that when the call comes out, they, they are in the background of an awful lot of, of shots. So um, we have some time off, and I'm just in a tent off to by myself in order to close my eyes and get out of the heat, what have you. And a fellow comes in, some other folks are there, and a fellow comes in and he puts down his bag, and I happen to notice that he has one arm. He is, in fact, an amputee actor. And I said something like, hey, man, uh, which I think is very ecumenical of me, don't you think? <laughs> uh, if I'm using the word ecumenical, correct. Uh, I said, hey, man. He said, oh, uh, hey, uh, hey, Tom. Fair enough, that's all right. I'm on the call sheet, they know my name. <laughs> and, uh, and I say, how are you doing today? I say, I'm doing good, doing good. And he said, hey, uh, do, you mind, uh, do you mind if I mention something to you? I said, we're just sitting here, dude. And he said, so this is the second time we've worked together. I said, oh, really? We've done something before then? He said, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I was at Forrest Gump. <laughs> And I'm, not, I'm looking at him now and thinking, I remember, yeah, you were. You were the guy in the hospital when I was watching Gomer Pyle on TV, and you said, Gump, turn that shit off. You, you had a line. He said, yeah, I did. He said, wow. He said, that was my first job. Really? Your first job? 
as a as an actor, you get a line in the movie. That's that, that's pretty big. Yeah, yeah. I heard you know somebody told me about it because of this and blah blah blah. So I got it. And there you go. So that meant that's a big deal. So that was the first time we worked, and I guess this will be the second again, yeah, second time. I said, wow. Well, that's that's a lot of time. I think uh, El Gumpo was like 1993, and now it's 2000 something. So it's been a long time. So I said, how how have you worked a lot? He says, I've worked just enough, uh, but actually I've gone to law school, and this now is my last job as an actor, because uh, I passed the bar exam and I'm gonna be a lawyer. I said, dude, this is quite an honor, and ain't that a goofy thing about making movies? You and I had met on the first movie you ever made as an actor, and now the last movie I've ever made. I said, you have just made my day, that's very special. And I bring this up because the first time we worked together, the Vietnam Hospital set was right here at the Wilshire E. Bell Theater, over, oh, yeah. the, over in the structure of the, the, uh, the lounge. And what, we did it all up, and that's where Gary Sinise lost his legs, and I ate ice cream, and learned how to play ping pong, and <laughs> an uh, you know, a special, a special uh, uh, talent uh, cast member had his very first line of the Screen Actors Guild saying, go, turn that shit off, it's right here. <laughs> and that is part of like the, kind of the odd serendipity, and yet there's a little bit more to it than just a, a story about making a movie. It's about a guy's life and his dreams and what happened. And that is just one of the types of things that goes into, ladies and gentlemen, the making of another major motion picture masterpiece. <laughs> I, I thought you were going to say he's now suing you for copyright infringement for stealing your story. Um, before we talk well, about he's a lawyer, isn't he? Yeah, so yeah, you never know. Might not have anything else to do. Um, we're going to talk about one other thing quickly before we get into the book, and that is 1947, which I think is, you know, about the start of this book. There's a guy named Jack Warner, brother to Sam, who said this of actors, an actor is a schmuck. And he said of this of screenwriters, name checking a pretty good brand of a writing tool, a screenwriter is a schmuck with an underwood. <laughs> so I guess in Jack Warner's eyes, you would be a double schmuck, or in Hollywood, he's you know, schmuck I'm going to tell you what, they may be right, but we certainly made those sons of bitches a ton of money. Well, so here we go. So those schmucks, schmucks with underwoods, underwoods. Yeah. The schmucks with underwoods are now on strike. What's your take on the strike? Uh, there's no doubt that with uh, the uh, the future is upon us. I have been. i when I first came out to do Bosom Buddies. Thank you, Bosom Buddies. Yeah. yeah. We made we made the pilot uh, in March. Uh, it was sold in May, I think. And I came out to do an episode of The Love Boat in June. Uh, you don't have to plot the love boat, but God bless you, man. That's awfully cool of you. Um, and then the actors went on strike in 1980 on, on June 30th, and we stayed out on strike uh, until mid-October, and that, and then the writers went out again the very next year, and that was because there was this thing coming down the pike, and there may be people that disagree with me in the audience, but I don't. Uh, I don't care. Um, <laughs> they, they were, there was already this thing coming down the pipe that they knew of a, a new revenue stream. It was home video. The VHS had been invented. They know that there was going to be this, this pipeline of cash that had never been in the business before that was coming down. And so I think uh, my, my recollection of the history of those strikes is that it was coming and they wanted to work out what that was going to be. And there was, you know, whatever happened, they, they said, well, let's find out what it is, let's draw, blah, 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 blah. And there's been some strikes ever since, and it's always been about, um, I think, the, this understanding that a new thing was coming down, so let's figure out what that pie is. I think we all now know the economic realities of streaming, and the, we are at an evolutionary crossroads as far as how that pie, and when I talk about the pie, I'm talking about the new place that society is in, in which there are so many options for entertainment that this new concept is brought in is that we all now have to want to do something very unique that used to be standard in our lives. And the unique thing is we need to leave our house 
drive to a place, be there at 7.45, park the car, buy a ticket, get the red vines and the Diet Coke, and then sit in a room with a bunch of strangers to watch a movie. That now is farther down the food chain than it used to be. So, uh, I am a member of every guild there is, and I am on strike. And because this is going to have to be determined, not just for the future of the bread and butter issues that affect us all, but also for the, the arts and sciences of motion pictures. Thank you. Woo! <laughs> there, there's an old, now I'm gonna tell you, this folks from CAA, they're rather going like this. <laughs> There is an old expression about creative writing, which is write what you know, and your book, for some obvious reason, obvious reasons, but it's not bold. But you can also change that maxim and say write whom you know. And I have to assume that you have worked alongside some very impressive, self-made, and talented women throughout your career, because this book could have been called, and it's not a catchy title, Women Who Solve Problems. Um, there's Candace, or Dace, there's Al, there's Ren, there's Nev, principally, and the one person who doesn't do his job is a guy, and he's an actor. <laughs> so I'm gonna ask you about women who solve problems and why that is such an important theme in this story. Well, I will tell you that um, the women that I, and now, uh, and, and, look, I, I'm, I don't know if I've worked with maybe more women directors than most, but the ones who, you know, essentially, altered and saved my career twice was Penny Marshall. The, the women filmmakers, the women writers, the women executives, certainly, uh, uh, certainly the, the actors as well, um, did, have, did not come by their place in the cultural zeitgeist of the business very easily. They had to l l claw to a degree tooth and nail because they were women. Um, women, uh, the other directors that uh, uh, that I've worked with, uh, I'm, uh, as a as a producer, them uh, them too. Um, I don't know if it's based on gender or puffery, but I would I would say this: when it came down to the moment where um, problems have to be solved, the women that I've worked with are the toughest and the most thorough. Because they put it in, <laughs> which means my power of charms were worthless in trying to. Uh, because they put it in this kind of way, it's a problem. Uh, I, not every a lot of guys I work with say, hey, "Look, it didn't work out. It didn't work out. It didn't work out." So I'm sorry, it didn't work out. <laughs> Women come and say, "It's a problem, and we cannot have a problem." <laughs> there is a, one of the things that I have since learned that a lot of movies start, and any kind of projects, start shooting on a Wednesday. Why do you think it starts shooting on a Wednesday? Because by Friday you know who the problem is. <laughs> <laughs> and that person is not there on Monday. And someone who will solve the problem is there. And if, you know, and if and anybody. You know, anybody, I'm going to just assume no one here is a non-combatant because it's Los Angeles. Maybe there's no <laughs> civilians in the room, okay? We know the hard-assed aspects of what we do for a living or even if we just want to do for a living. Some version of all of us has done something like moved to Los Angeles, slept in a car for as long as it took in order to do what we want to do for a living. And we know that it's hard work. We're lucky if we get it. You gotta make it stick. And there's a number of things that you can do that can prove the best thing that we could have in our pocket. And that is, we are known for causing no problems. <laughs> Even if you're an actor, you could be known for causing no problems. Even if you are a son of a bitch, you do nothing but cause problems <laughs> for a while. They'll give you, they'll give you, you know, that option. Matter of fact, I hope that any director that calls another director to ask about me. So, Hanks, true, false, what's the deal? Oh, Tom solves problems for you. How do you do that as an actor? You show up on time. No, sorry, you show up early. You get there early. 
you know exactly what you're going to be shooting and you're familiar with the text, not just your own lines, but the entire movie that you're making. And you have an idea in your pocket that you don't waste anybody's time telling them about. I think the actor's job is to provide the motivation for whatever is necessary for us in the city. And that means uh, go over there and look out the window. Okay. I know exactly why, why are you working out. Oh, I got all kinds. I got 19 reasons why I'm looking out the window. I just bought a new car. I'm worried about the pay job. There's a lot of seagulls around. They're going to take a shit on the car. <laughs> I'm working out the window. And then you come back and Tom, what were you so busy with over at the window, man? You're just in the background. Like, oh, I got a whole thing going on here, boss. Don't worry. I'm okay. So you end up solving a problem for somebody, and every every place in, in the creative dialectic of making a movie is somebody who can either solve a problem or cause one. And if you cause more problems than you solve, than you solve, you are buttered toast. Bye bye. Go away. You're in the way. You're, you're making it too hard for us to do something that is nearly freaking impossible in the first place. And that is make the day and have it be good, and make sure it's cuttable, you know. That's, that's, it, that's one of the basic aspects of it that um, then has to be matched. How many, how many actors do we have in the, in the room? Woo! Okay, so you all know, you have to do all that other stuff, right? You gotta do the time thing and be there, you gotta not solve problems, but then emotionally, you have to go to this place that would make other people start raving nuts. You know, and you gotta do it every time, every scene, everything, you can't fake it. You have to actually go there crazy ass deep. And why? Well, like for example, there's a there's a nightmare of a, of a cast member. We'll, we'll get to that. Okay, all right, all right. So, so spoil solve again. problems, John Horn, solve problems. <laughs> solve more than you cause and you might, you might be okay. <laughs> the, Characters in this novel, almost to a person, are not cynical. They actually love not just making movies, but the idea of making movies. Um, I'm wondering, has that been as much your experience as it is a reaction to the way that stories about movie making are typically told with cynicism? Well, yes, because I find that this, this is a very hard-edged, tough, brutal business, particularly if you live in Los Angeles. But cynicism cannot rue the day. It cannot come from a cynical perspective. Not that, look, look, here, here I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna make a confession that we all have to keep to ourselves. Because <laughs> if this gets out, it might seem as though we are really quite cynical, and we're not, all right? Maybe, maybe we're not cynical until Maybe we're optimistic until the third or fourth time. Put the fucking phones down. I do not want you. I'm joking. I don't want you. <laughs> there's, there's no such thing as privacy in this world anyway, so what are you going to do? But I will tell you this deep, dark secret that you will, shh, quiet, keep it to yourself. Quiet, quiet, okay, okay. When, say, the award season comes around, okay, the first thing you do is vote for yourself. <laughs> the second thing you do is vote for your friends. Right? Your friends, your loved ones, your friends. You want them. The third thing you do is vote against your enemies. <laughs> Meaning that you don't vote for them. You vote for anybody else but them. <laughs> you literally go through and pick somebody from a movie or name you reckon and you put them in because you do not want that enemy nemesis of yours to get in. You do not want that. <laughs> and the last thing you do is, is really vote your conscience and who did a really great job. That's it. That's it. Now that, that, sound, that sounds very cynical, but it's kind of like, you know, that's why we, it's like high school with money. So that's kind of like, but since I, I do, when you when you are actually making the movie, or there's a possibility that you're making a movie, cynicism and to a degree ego has to be checked at the door because it cannot be a cynical process. Otherwise, you cannot do the best work that is expected of you. And that goes if you've got the biggest lines on the day in the sides, or if you're the or if you're the generator operator that you know has to make sure that the power grid stays up.
I want you to read uh, this paragraph that starts Alicia. <laughs> Um, because I think this is an example of what I was talking about. About Alicia Founders? Yes. Okay. And if you need to set it up, I think this is a table read, right? And this is Alicia's first job. Okay, yes. This is um, Alicia. Alicia. Alicia has started off because she was, um, she was the night clerk at the hotel where the folks are staying. And she heard somebody mention that they really wish they had frozen yogurt. And without telling anybody what she was doing, she went off and ordered frozen yogurt and had it direct, uh, delivered up to the person's room. The person turns out to be the director of the film, who then tells his assistant that um, uh, somebody in this hotel made sure I got frozen yogurt and I didn't even say much of anything. And so that person goes to this lady, Alicia, and says, you just solved the problem for me. And she ends up being hired because, as a local hire, who knows where it's gonna go because she solves problems in the production office. Alicia found herself swept up in the moment, breathless. Something new to her experience was about to happen, and she was in the room as both a witness and participant. She was going to help make a motion picture. Her body felt a tingle. She lost a bit of her psychological balance, physiological balance, her spiritual equilibrium, sensing a part of herself rising up up, up, and out of her body. A spectral version of herself was suspended in the room there in the P.O. on 10 Penn Alley. She saw herself, she saw everyone sitting below her around the square of tables under fluorescent lights as Bill Johnson read his own stage directions, as the actors read their lines with varying degrees of certainty and commitment. When the lingering spirit of Alicia heard Bill Johnson say, fade to black, Roll in credits, the corporeal Alicia Mactier found her eyes misted, her hands applauding. She felt safe. Reading from the book of... Uh... <laughs> I'm, I'm wondering if there are certain characters that you found easier to write or harder to write, and did those have anything to do with characters that you saw yourself in or the opposite, that you knew that this was so far away from you, it was actually easier to accomplish? Um, I, okay, I'm, I'm gonna ask the internet to please uh, not have a sense of humor about itself, okay, for a minute, because the internet does not register, say, like sarcasm or some degree of humility or self-deprecation. But at some point I said something like, I don't know how many movies I've made, I don't know, 60, but and four of them are pretty good, you know. What four are they? What do movies do they hate? How can you say that? It's like, God, oh, cut me some slack, man. I'm a smart ass who got lucky. So, um, no easy. Um, every, more or less, I will say everything, uh, euphemistically, everything in this book, I have either witnessed or heard of or caused myself <laughs> um, in the course of making the movie. The stories are all based on stories that I heard. The experience are all based on movie making experience that I have had. And uh, it, what <clears throat> it, none of them necessarily are about what helped the movie get made, but they are all about what goes on in the course of making the movie, which is the point of the book. I don't think anybody knows how a movie is made, everybody assumes they know how a movie is made. Any more than they know, you know, they assume what the life of George and Copeland is because they, they saw Yankee Doodle Dandy. Well, it's really different, you know, in real life, so. In fact, at the beginning of the novel says, the following is based on a true story. Characters and events have been altered for dramatic purposes. Um, there's a lead actor in the novel who, tell me if this is fair, has his head up his ass. Um, so I want to set up a scene in the book. Autobiographical. <laughs> so the director, Bill, is talking to Edward Norton. I'm sorry. He's talking with Val Kilmer. I'm sorry. So Christian Bale walk. No, I'm sorry. Truth is. The character's name is O.K. Bailey. Um, and I'm gonna have you read one more scene. Oh, this is about Bill meeting with O.K. Oh, sorry, thank you. Uh, you can start with, it would be helpful to honor. Okay. O.K. Bailey is the star of this film. 
Hold on, where it would be helpful? Where? Be helpful. Oh, <clears throat> all right. Okay, this th <laughs> this is a conversation on the set on the first day of shooting. Be the director and the and number, Tom Hardy right? and the top the above the line, you know, above the line number two on the call sheet, uh, Tyler Carey. <laughs> It would be helpful uh, if, say, in the early takes we approach Firefall with the adage, less is, less is more, being our goal. Well, in some movies I found that less is less, as if not enough. Al's cranium echoed with the silent snort of derision at this. The kid has made two movies. <laughs> two. Bill said, we could do with less optional takes and save that time. Okay, but he said, yeah, but having enough takes time. I can't be heard to do my job, guys. I do not want to hurry your process, Bill calmly explained, but I don't want to waste your time or your efforts, so let's nail it. Then we can rejig and play around some. I, ne I need to be loose, see, the actor said, to let the character flow out of me unfiltered without a lot of rules laid down on me, you know, like we did today. Where we're already half a day behind. Oh, let me let me let me change this. This is in the trailer after the first day of shooting. This is the meeting that occurs on a Wednesday when the director and the producer comes in and says, "Hey, can we have a word about tomorrow?" <laughs> so that's it's in, it's in his trailer, his Schlegel Milch, if you will. Um, where we're already half a day behind. Al said, "You're talking schedule, sweetie." Okay, B just called Al McTeer, sweetie. Not my concern. My gig here is to walk and talk and strut and scare as firefighter army man every morning I'm in the lens. That is what OKB does for you. Schedule is production stooges with radios in their ears. Well, let's, let, let's do this, Bill offered. Tomorrow, you and I talk some before, so we're on the same page, so we can both, you know, feel good about what we get. Oh, you mean like in here before I go into the torture chamber? He meant the works. When you are comfortable and ready to jump in, say on the set for 15 minutes and we get a few takes, then we can play around. I think it would be better if we just do half a dozen takes, see what's in the box, and then talk some. Ah, that was what Bill said. Just that. Ah. <laughs> it's how I work best. Truth is time independent, man. There's nothing wrong with going deep and long to capture the truth, n'est-ce pas? And I gotta confess to I feel great about where we ended up with Firefly by the end of the day. The character's name is Firefall, by the way. <laughs> I'm, well, I'm glad, Bill said, rising, moving to the trailer door onward. Now, um, truth is not time dependent. That truth is not time dependent. <laughs> that feels like an overheard conversation. Now, I'm gonna tell you. I have had, I have been the actor in that conversation more than once, trying to convince somebody to let me do something that I really wanted to do, and said, I mean, look, look this is how I work, you know. <laughs> this is what you get. <laughs> and sometimes that comes about because we actually are not making the same movie, which is a critical, that happens, you know. All these reasons to work together come around, but it turns out you're not really making the same movie. I've made four of them. <laughs> Never mind which one. Um, but the other part of it, I've also been the director saying, dude, I mean, look, we have to make a day, and so there's a thing. Look, you know, some, I'm just going to go off and do your thing. But the other thing that comes out of it is there, as you learn over time, there is, there is a certain... Um, uh, there is a certain responsibility the actor has. Now, what I think I would like to think that I've learned that is I just say, "Let me, let me show you, let me show you, let me show you." And then after that, it's like, "How, how can I help? What do you need, boss?" Um, Penny Marshall uh, said something great. I was, I was really full of myself the first time I worked with Penny. Uh, that was a hot shot, man. And I'd be, you know, "Hey, man, I made Turner and Hooch, man." I, 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 <laughs> in a 66-year-old fog. <laughs> but um, she was, uh, um, we were doing it, we just did, did it so many times. And I said, 
My God, Penny, what do you want? 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 How many more times are we going to do this? What do you want? And she said, I don't know what I want. But I'm going to be in a dark room at eight months, and I'm going to have this here. I'm going to say, can't we get something there? We can't because we didn't shoot it. So I got to get there, and I got to get there, and I got to get here. Because if I don't have it, it's not in the movie. <laughs> and that was actually a very liberating moment because I said, oh my God, this person, it's not an auteur theory. You literally are saying, help me find something new. Let's test this material and get it. And what your job is, Tom, is to do it as many fucking times as I can ask you to do it. <laughs> Who's the boss here? She is. She is the boss. So an important lesson, and I'm going to say that was like, I don't know, that was like my ninth movie or something like that. And that's a great lesson to get from somebody because she wasn't yelling at me. She was explaining to me the collective creative process in which she needed me to be her ally. And I was not her adversary. And there are some times you work with somebody who treats you like an adversary, and guess what? It does become an adversarial uh, relationship after one. But that's also a big part of the, of the novel, in that on any given day, an actor has to know his, her, or their lines. They have to do a performance. It's the basic minimum. Yeah. Yeah. Show up on time. <laughs> but there are also... You'd be amazed, though, how often it's like, what are we doing? What? What is it? What are the lines? Am I here? Blah, 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 blah. You know, okay, yeah, I know. Bullshit, bullshit, bullshit. My line, bullshit, bullshit, bullshit. What is my line again? What is it? What is it? Pardon me? What? What is it? What is it? What? Okay, can we do it again? You cannot mean that. Is it you cannot mean that? Is that what the line is? You cannot mean that? You can mean You don't mean that. You don't mean that. You, are we rolling? Keep rolling. Just keep rolling. Keep rolling. Keep rolling. Keep rolling. You don't mean that. 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 You don't You don't mean that. You don't mean that. You don't mean that. You don't mean that. That. That's how some people shoot scenes with their lines, you don't mean that. <laughs> From the Teamsters, who get a very nice shout out, to hair and makeup, to the PA who's getting everyone's coffee order just right. So telling those people's story feels very important in telling this story in this novel. Let me, let me tell you this one thing that ha I wish I could remember the exact uh, movie, but again, 66 year old lost in the fall. Um, the base camp, by the way, the base camp for Forrest Gump was right over here in the parking lot. The base camp is a million, you know, a million trucks, all the RVs, hair and makeup, everybody's over the prop truck, the lighting truck, the gaffers, everything, the greens person, craft service, it's all over there. And I, on some gig, I needed something, I needed a better pin or I needed some better prop, so I went to, to the uh, prop truck. And the prop truck is essentially a bunch of closets and drawers and everything. And everything is perfectly laid out. And you could go to the prop truck and ask for anything. And there's a guy in there who knows exactly where it is, you know. <laughs> what do you need? You need a fountain pen from the 1940s? You need a pair of baby shoes? You need a can of hairspray? You get right, boom, boom, boom. <laughs> and you've got it. So I go into one, and I'm going to say the guy's name was Cubby. And oftentimes, you know, one of the things about making movies is the guys who've been doing it for a long time, their bodies begin to break down because in the more physical aspects of the job, our, our brothers in I, IA, IOTSE, you know, their backs go out, their hips go back, and you can't necessarily be a gaffer and, you know, and live for a long time. And the prop guys are on their feet. It's an awful lot of work that has to be done. Early. So sometimes the person on the truck is the senior citizen might have a knee brace, might be getting a new hip replaced pretty soon, but it's oftentimes a seasoned, seasoned veteran. And so one time, and he sits on, they sit on a, he or she, many, many women, sit on a, sit on a stool, 
right next to the cappuccino maker, and they just sit there all day long. And uh, you go in there, and uh, hey, what do you need, Tom? Hey, Tommy, what? Hey, Tommy, what do you need? What do you need? So, well, I'm looking for some baby shoes and a fountain pen from the 1940s. And, oh yeah, yeah, here you go, here you go. Hey, want a cup of coffee? I had a quick cup of coffee, and say, so hey, hey, Cubby, what's the deal? How long have you been doing this? Oh, I got it, Tom. I've been doing this a long time, you know. Yeah, I mean, when Brian called me, he needed a guy here on the truck. And I, I look, I want to keep the pension and welfare up, and I need the health plan, so I'll come back in to do it. You know, I gave up, I gave up working really uh, hard crops. I was on, I was on that block for nine and a half years. <laughs> and Griffith is a great guy, that is. He is just a great, he reminds me of you, Tom. He's a really, really great guy. <laughs> well, I did that for a while, and then uh, I was on the 5 0 for a bit, Hawaii 5 0, the new one, you know, nothing. Like so I was doing that for a while. Then, uh, and then, oh God, you know, I went down to Argentina on Taurus Bull, but I didn't need that. I've been doing that, but not since that Brian needed a guy. And so, you know, I've been coming in here and I'm just doing this. I'm just doing this. It's a good show. It's a good show. It's a good show. You're making a good show here. I like the show that you're doing. I think it's a good show. And Brian needed some hands, so I decided to come in here. <laughs> so, I said, well, um, I mean, how did you get started? What was, what was your first job? Oh, my first job? Oh gosh. Well, let's see. That was, well, I had just got back from Vietnam. And after that, what are you going to talk about? You know, his years on Matlock? No. I said, well, excuse me, excuse me. How old were you got back from Vietnam? Oh, I was 24. What year was that? Oh, God, that was 72. Well, shit. You know, I want to hear more about that guy's story. And that type of experience is, is the, it's the breadth of making any movie. And it's not just the crew who are the blue collar aspects of it. It's also, you know, let me tell you a story about, I made a movie with Charles Durney. <clears throat> Char Charles Durney, you know the character actor Charles Durney? He's a great actor. I saw him on, I saw him as Big Daddy on Broadway and I made him, <laughs> Okay, you don't, you don't have to plot for this one, okay? All right. I made a movie called The Man With One Red Shoe. It was my third movie. Shot it, shot it, shot it, four. shot it at Fox. It was like a big dream come true. It was great. And Charles Durney was in it. Um, and um, Charles Durney, great character actor. This was, I think we made it in, it, was, it would have been 1982, maybe. 80, 82, 83. And Charles Durney was a World War II veteran who made the, uh, he was in the second wave on Utah Beach, and he has written about having killed enemy soldiers with his bare hands on Utah Beach. And we're making the man with one red shoe. <laughs> so that's an extreme version. Let me tell you, this one, this one might be a little bit better. Okay, go a little easier on it, because they're like, oh, Jesus. Vietnam, Normandy, Tom, cut us some slack here. No wonder what no wonder your your, your production slate is what it is for <clears throat> I was we were making, believe it or not, we were making um, Sleepless in Seattle. <laughs> I'll tell you, these are the stories you'll read in the book, so it's not just, you know, Tom's, you know, skate through skate through his enchanted career. It's not it doesn't have to be that. <clears throat> but um, uh, we were somebody um, somebody had been playing Tetris. Remember when Tetris first came out? And it had that do 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 <clears throat> and the lady was making me up can't remember what her name was, but uh, um, she was making me up and I started humming the song, the theme song to Tetris. <laughs> She says, Tetris. I played Tetris 18 straight months, 12 hours a day in order to get me through my divorce. <laughs> now, what, what conversation do you want to have after that? Tell me how you did that. Oh my God, I couldn't eat, I couldn't sleep, I thought I was going to go, I thought I was going to lose my kids, and that son of a bitch was taking me for everything. You know, it's like that's... So you end up having these, these, these moments with people that are so removed from the cuckoo nutty job that we do that expands the, uh, you know, it just expands your connection to something bigger than yourself.
And that's really reflected in the book, because one of the things that filmmakers are constantly told is cut the exposition or the backstory, get to the action. I'm in favor of it. Cut the backstory. Lose, lose the boilerplate. Blah, 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 blah. Although TV can't exist without it, because at the end, at, you know, after every act break on a cop show, somebody walks into the set like this. Well, it turns out Ramirez was in the Marine Corps. He was stationed down in, he was stationed down in Guantanamo and in fact knows how to sail his own boat and jump out of airplanes. So I think we got ourselves a major suspect. <laughs> now that requires a type of uh, exposition that you're going to have. But in terms of backstory, you rarely get to explore so much about your characters' lives before they become part of the story, which is what you do in this book. You get to have exposition, you get to have backstory. Before these characters are characters in the story that you're telling, you get to go back, which is so contrary to how you would typically write a screenplay or the kind of notes you would get from a studio executive. It's like, we don't need to know that, but it's very important that we as readers know that about these characters. Well, yeah, because it, it, everything, it, Everything is impacted by in ways that you just know it ends up carrying gravitas. Now, the, if you want to read a really sloppy screenplay, thank you, uh, you can read the screenplay that I had to write. Uh, there, yeah, I think I, somebody knows how to do it. You take a picture of a QR code, and you can read it, or it's only the thing. Because I had to write what they were shooting in order to go along with it. And the, the name of the movie that they're making is a, sort of a, a one-off superhero movie called Nightshade, the lathe of Firefall. <laughs> what is a lathe? A, la <laughs> a lathe is a machine that you use in order to shape wood. By the way, good joke, because <laughs> he's making a reference because some of the executives wanted to change the name of the movie because they don't know what a lathe is. So, um, <laughs> all right, you know. Okay, I, I get a bunch of cheap shots in the book like that. Um, so the character, Eve, Eve Nightshade is a, is a young woman who is tortured by her superpowers and doesn't want to be a superhero and is only trying to protect her grandfather who is a, uh, who is a Marine Corps veteran and Firefall is the specter of a Marine uh, who is a flamethrower that is coming for him. Uh, that's, the, that's essentially the movie in a nutshell. So uh, the character then, the main character is a flamethrower and you have to just by way of example, um, if you're starting a movie from scratch, uh, Castaway, thank you. Um, <laughs> Castaway germinated from an idea that I, that I had when I read an article about FedEx that said jumbo jets filled with nothing but packages and letters flew across the Pacific Ocean twice a day. And I thought, well, what happens if one of those goes down? And that was the German germination, the beginning of the story of Castaway. Well, um, I had read many, 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 many years ago that outlaw motorcycle gangs in Southern California, the Hells Angels and what have you, uh, the origins for them was from veteran, Marine veterans that came back from fighting the war in the Pacific that had done such heinous deeds and witnessed such terror and horror that they themselves did and they themselves witnessed that there was no way they were going to take their combat pay and go back to wherever they were and become accountants. So they bought the war surplus motorcycles and became the Hells Angels. And that a character, one of them, uh, is the uncle of one of the one of the key players in the development of the source material. The book is written, the book is broken up into these sections. Source material. Um, right? What is it? Can I, can I read what it says? Here's the chapter. <laughs> can you read the book? I can't read it. Yeah. What a thick, fabulous book. Holy cow. <laughs> 3250. Is that a bargain or is that a, uh, uh, I don't know. Can you read them out? I don't even, oh, here they are. I'm uh, sorry. I got to get my glasses out. Where are my glasses? Here they are. Um, backstory. Right? Okay. Backstory. Which is kind of like the beginning of, how, you know, what went into, how, who came together and made this movie? Source material, which is all the stuff that you collect in order to learn about the era, the time, the design, the characters, whatnot. Development hell, we all know what that is, don't we? Don't we seasoned veterans? <laughs> like, a good idea for a movie that just never quite gets going and everybody's trying to make it work and maybe it doesn't, maybe it doesn't. Ah, but then you go into prep which can go on, you know, however long that takes, and it's often, you know, its own version of nightmare. 
casting, and then the shoot, and then post, all very specific tributaries in the, in the making of the movie. But the guy who is responsible for the source material is seven years old when he meets his uncle, who is a, a, a veteran from the Pacific War, who was a flamethrower, who comes back into his life when he's much, much older, and he's an artist, and he draws comic books. And so the Bill Johnson, the director, he's trying to make a, 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 a boy meets girl love story in the confines of you know people with superpowers because that's the only fucking movie that gets made these days. <laughs> we should well, pardon my salty language. We should note too that the, this veteran has what was called shell shock. Then he clearly has incredibly difficult PTSD, which is part of his story and part yes. of how this story um, comes about. Very early in the book, and I'll try not to take personal offense here, Bill, the director of the movie and the novel says, <laughs> quoting him now, or quoting you, journalists, the lazy ones anyway, always try to explain how movies are made as though there's a secret formula we patented or procedures that are listed like a flight plan to the moon and back. Those people look at the northern lights as having been designed. If they saw how we movie orphans do our job, they'd be bored, silly, and very disappointed." Unquote. So, is your novel in a way a corrective to that way of thinking about how movies are made? Yes, it is. <laughs> um, there is, how do you explain the intangible? How do you explain one damn thing after another? You can't. Uh, you, particularly if you're starting with the end result, I mean, I, uh, I, will, I will take cheap shots at journalists because I've spoken to a few many of them in the course of my career. Mm -hmm. And there is a kind of like supposition, so, this is like, a, so you must have had a great time making this movie. Tell me about your new movie, Tom. <laughs> wow, that must have been really, really crazy. What's it like? What's it like? What's it like? You, know, you know, Stephen is such a genius. You know, how do you get along with Stephen? Any funny stories? <laughs> You know the scene where you do that thing and you cry? How'd you do that scene exactly? What went into it? How did you get to the point where you cried and wept and shook your fists in the sky? What, what was going through your head when you did that? <laughs> ha, 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 what's the secret to being married for 35 years? You know? <laughs> That's the nature of the discourse oftentimes that goes into what, because we've seen movies and stuff like that that explain and make them. We think we, think we all know that it's planned so. And I could walk you through movies that you yourself know, that I love, and I've since done enough, you know, hearing about it. There's actually, there's this great, can I, can I tell the Casablanca story? Sure. They're, they're all happening. Everybody in a movie loves nothing better than to get together and talk about movies all night long, the ones we love with it. There's, there's this famous story about Casablanca, all right? And this is how movies are made. I'm actually telling you something you already know. But this is just an example of it, because this, it's never changed. Movies are still made this exact way. Humphrey Bogart loved to be at Ciro's with a cocktail in his hand at six o'clock every single night, right? He's working at Warner Brothers on a movie called Casablanca. There's nine different writers. Michael Curtiz is the director. He's got a funny Hungarian voice. And he needs to shoot something. Gotta shoot something, because the lights are up. Bogie's in his white tuxedo, they're in Rick's. They're part of a big, long thing. There's everybody's dressed up, all the dress actors are in it. And this is a story, is that <clears throat> not knowing what else to shoot, but knowing maybe what was gonna be coming down the pipe, Michael Curtiz says to Bogie, uh, Bogie, why don't you just come <clears throat> on action? You come, you hit the mark, you look off, you give a nod, okay? And then we yell cut, and then you can go to Ciro's and have dinner. You know, with everybody, you know, with, uh, uh, with Jimmy Stewart, Van Heflin, or whatever it is. <laughs> Let me get this straight. You want me to, okay, hold on. And action, boom, done, hit the mark, nod. But what was Bogey nodding at? A, a, a cat, you know, the, the DP, the, the, the top, you know, the, the, the roach coach. No one knows. He just come up, and he's an incredibly great gifted actor. Knows exactly what's going to end with gravitas. No connection to what he was actually nodding at. Sam, the piano player, uh, the Russian bartender, no idea. But then when you see the movie, he's nodding at Victor Laszlo, uh, uh, what's his name, anyway, who stands, with the Nazis are singing like their Hitler Youth song, and Victor goes up to the band and says, play the Marseillaise. <clears throat> and they were big, whoa, we don't want to get in trouble here. Play, play the Marseillaise. And the band leader looks over his shoulder 
to Humphrey Bogart, who has walked up, hit a mark, and given a nod on screen. So it's the most important, one of the most important bone chilling movies in the history of all cinema, and it was shot because they had nothing else to shoot that day. <laughs> that is making movies. That's a happy accident. I have one last question, and then we have some audience questions. There are footnotes in nonfiction books. It could be a Civil War biography, and the footnote says, you know, General Polk then fought later against him in the Battle of Tennessee. Yeah. There could be footnotes like David Foster Wallace's that are novels unto themselves. And there are footnotes in this book, which I will describe to you. Reading the book, you go, I wonder. And Tom Hanks taps you on the shoulder and goes, I think this is what that means. So could you tell me a little bit about the footnotes and how they came to be? And the water. <laughs> Solving problems. <laughs> I'm like, like a good screener, I stole that from somebody who said it in the audience. Okay, yes. You know what you know what an actor might say at this point? Oh thank you, that's great. Well can you open the goddamn thing for me for crying out loud? Wait, hold on a bit, keep rolling, keep rolling, keep rolling. No, we'll get it. One second, just keep rolling, I'll get it, I'll get it. You can't mean that! <laughs> Is it the right temperature? Um, as you might be able to tell, I, I kind of speak in asterisks, you know? Um, uh, and I it just kind of like, you, you want to explain something a little bit better, but then there's kind of like a tangent that you can go off to. And, uh, and it, it, it's quite selfishly, if I had written it in regular prose, it would have added so many pages onto it that it would have been, caused a problem with Penguin. So I used a smaller font and asterisks in order to get into the uh, little smaller details that I just think are all, all just so fascinating that you'll love every one of them. And show of hands, does, how many people know that why Red Vines are West Coast and, and uh, Twizzlers are East? Not many. What's the Let's hear, okay, that's, okay, first of all, and ready, uh, if you're East Coast and you grew up loving uh, Twizzlers, applause, please. Woo! West Coast Red Vines? I don't disagree. But it's a big, look, it's a, it's a major deal, man. It is a major deal. Uh, here's some audience questions. You didn't mention Bonfire of the Bay. No, I made that one. Uh, <laughs> do you find, this, this is a true question, do you find it more productive as a writer when you stick to a schedule or when you give spontaneous inspiration your full attention? Oh, oh, uh, the, that's literally like about writing. The, look, the, yeah, process of writing, uh, the, the, when you're productive. And uh, I guess maybe in particular how this book was written. Well, it's all, it's all just such heavy lifting, ain't it? How many writers are in the room tonight? You know? yeah. One thing to do, you, know, you, you sit there and you sit there and do it. Um, uh, the uh, you you pray that spontaneousness is going to land upon you because you you know you're kind of like in a groove. I will tell you this. Um, um, I read this thing about the Pomodoro timing technique. You know, this is literally a tool that writers use. <laughs> and if you set a timer for 25 minutes like a kitchen timer that might be shaped like a tomato, just the pomodoro, <laughs> right? Um, and you set it for 25 minutes, you concentrate, you write through that 25 minutes, and as soon as the thing goes ding, you get up right where you left off and do anything else for five minutes, mm -hmm. anything. Then you come back and do another 25. It's amazing how often you come back and not only pick up right where you left off, but have an idea for what's, what's, going, to, what's going to come next. Uh, no substitute except sitting down and either doing it or waiting for it to happen. And was that the case in this book? Were you sitting down doing it, or was it between jobs? What was the process? Well, I had long stretches where I did nothing but this, and but I I, I also think that if you're you know the the day job can be so so all encompassing you know so it's it's there's a physiological part of making a movie because. This air that you breathe, the places that you go, and you put on other people's clothes, it becomes very, very familiar. But there, you, you, there, I have found that there is, there is an escape is necessary. You have to do something else, otherwise you get bogged down in the minutia. And there, you might be. You, I find it a possibility just to. You, you don't want to become cynical about just having to do it all again. 
So, for you know, sometimes you just come home and hopefully there's a good, you know, Stanley Cup hockey game on to watch for an hour and a half. But uh, there's the other times where it's like, the call is, I'm going to be picked up at 7.15. Um, I want to be ready and up anyway, so I'm going to get up at 4.30 and write some before we get to it. And it's not that heavy a day for me anyway. Speaking of the Stanley Cup sports question, could you please, I don't know if it's a question or a, or a plea, could you please buy the Oakland A's to keep them in Oakland? <laughs> We've lost the Raiders. The Warriors moved to San Francisco. And now they're going to take the A's out of Oakland. Damn them all to hell. <laughs> There's only like 2,000 people showing up at games. It's really sad. But the greatest fans in all of baseball. <laughs> if, if Ryan Reynolds can do it in soccer, you can do it in the <laughs> Will any I haven't done that well, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Will any notable film industry folks recognize characters they specifically uh, they specifically recognize in the book? No, I don't think so. But, but I think they will recognize a you know a, a, a certain archetype. Uh, very rarely do I use anybody's real name because we all have preconceived notions about who those people are. I'd rather have them be like fresh fresh conceits. I will tell you this: there's a the uh, this this is something if, if you're an actor and uh, some actors do. And Ren Lang, who plays Eve Nightshade, she does this. She's in that position where. <clears throat> she's at home and she's going through the grid, the direct TV grid or whatever it is, and one of her old movies is on. That that's always a volatile moment. Because <laughs> you think Do I wanna do I wanna see in I know the movie hasn't changed since I saw it, so the only thing that's changed about it is my perspective of it. And I don't know I don't know what if I want to rewrite the experience of seeing that movie again. Because number one, I, I, maybe I was younger and much better looking, or maybe I was out of shape and much fatter than I am now. There's always moments in every movie that you think, ah, man, I wish I had that back again. There's also moments where you say, geez, I don't even remember that, holy cow, when, when, when did that get in the movie? But there's also those moments where you think, I, I hate this scene so much, <laughs> and I'm in it. <laughs> And I'm so bad, <laughs> and the writing is so horrible, and I wanted to choke the director to death for making me do it this way. And the scene goes on for 17 minutes. I have got to watch this. <laughs> and you do, and it's oddly enough, it's the, when I'm in something like a good scene, like, like I, if I, I lost, we, we lost Peter Scolari just last oh. October. Peter and I did Bosom Buddies together. And I went back, and thanks, Peter. God bless, God bless his eternal soul. Uh, blessed memory. Um, I went back and watched some of them just, uh, and it's funny, I didn't remember any of my lines, but I remembered all of Peter's. It was like, watch what Peter does here, watch what Peter does here. And um, the opposite is true, is when it's a scene that you absolutely hate. You remember every one of those goddamn lines <laughs> that you had to say, but you cannot tear yourself away. And it doesn't make you feel good. It actually makes you think like, I was such a coward and a pussy back then that I did that job. Besides, you know, we're not wanting to, but ah, paycheck's a paycheck. <laughs> Last audience question, then I have one final question. This question is, where's your favorite place to write or get inspired? There might be ones in the same or they might be different. Uh, I got to tell you, any 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 space any space works. Uh, um, uh, I, it, it, I don't I don't mean to be highfalutin about this, but in fact, the, the process is the same. Acting in a movie requires almost the same amount of writing as writing a novel does. You have to you have to create this stuff out of whole cloth that only you know, that only you are in control of, and then it blends in on a movie, it blends in with everybody else is brought to it, but then it, it continues along after that. Um, that. That begins the moment that you read the script for the first time and realize 
that on a Thursday in September, you're going to be uh, in, in Pittsburgh saying very specific lines to somebody very specific. You start writing in your head for that moment then. And the same thing goes, uh, goes into uh, the vast uh, thing. Like for example, somebody, uh, somebody asked about the, uh, the end of Castaway. You don't have to applaud if I've already mentioned them. <laughs> I'm not, I'm, not that, I'm not that sad of a human being. Uh, although we did shoot Forrest Gump, right? Uh, <laughs> um, I remember we, all the, all, in the years that we were talking to uh, about, uh, uh, about doing Castaway, first it was myself, and then Bill Broyles, the writer, came along. And Bill said, oh, well, you know, actually the... You know, the, the, the drama of finding the four elements of life could be really quite dramatic. I mean, Chuck will have to find food, water, shelter, and he'll have to make fire. That could be quite dramatic. <laughs> so he had, the, he had the second act, and then Bob, Bob Zemeckis came in years later and said, Yeah, well, you know what I'm doing, mean? yeah. You know, he's got to have a, he's got to have, you know, you know, company. And out of that, not someone to talk to. And out of that came Kim Wilson. So, uh, so that's the type of writing that goes into that, and it, it carried with it all that stuff into every day on the sick. But at the end of the movie, uh, you know, we, we, and by the way, we talked about this crazy because we were always writing up these scenarios that might not be in there or that. And um, somebody said, you know, the ending of a movie is a very particular thing that you have to land on, which is what I hope we, I touched on in this book, very specific ending. That has to be one thing. And you don't necessarily know what it is before you're going in it. Hopefully you get lucky. And uh, somebody said, uh, uh, what's it, uh, did, was there ever any other ending for Castaway? And I said, well, in my head, I wrote one. And it was great <laughs> in my head. And he said, well, what was it? Well, you know, if you know the movie, it's Bob said, yeah, we're going to end the movie right at the crossroads, man. The point of the compass, man. Right in the middle of nowhere, man. It's, you know, that she's going to take off and see those angels waiting for old man. Who knows what's going to happen with that? But, you know, are we going to see it? Are we going to see it? Are we going to see what happened? No, no. <laughs> and that's what we did. But in the movie, I thought, in my head, I said, well, then you cut to seven years later, and the artist lady is welding some statue in the barn, and I'm standing under a tree, playing with a five-year-old kid with an 18-month-old toddler and a blanket on the, on the grass. That was in the movie that I saw. Now, it doesn't matter that that's not there, because it actually is there, you know, in my head, and for anybody else that might ponder, you know, what, what is the time cut after those close credits? The last question are the last words written in the book, and these are the acknowledgments. These pages would not exist were it not for Nora. I think we know that's Nora Ephron. We all think of her, we do every single day. So how does Nora live in your work, and how does she live in this book? Nora was badass. <laughs> she had come out of a very a incredibly hard, and not a cynical woman at all, but a very, very hard, well, not, well, she had a cynicism to her, but it was, there was an intent to it, because she was a reporter, she was a journalist, so, number one, everything was copied to her, but also, number two, you, she could eke out a story that was not made up, even though you would not see what that story, what that story was. Um, um, I, I gave her a ton of trouble at the beginning of Sleepless in Seattle because it was only the second movie that she directed. Okay, she wrote Heartburn and she worked with Mike and she worked with Rob. She wrote, you know, she and Delia, her sister, had written uh, When Harry Met Sally. There was That's a, Mike Nichols. Uh, Mike Nichols, sorry, Mike, Mike Nichols, yeah. And here she wanted to do this romantic comedy with me and Meg, and I'd worked with Meg already on Joe versus the Volcano thing. Uh, and, um, and it's like, oh, so you want to, what, you want to jump on this gravy train, do you, you know, based on the studio? And I, I'm, the first time I met her, we were sitting, and, and look, I, I, 
This happens, you know, there's some combination of hubris and a lack of intelligence and a lack of empathy and, uh, you know, uh, just by and large, you know, thoughts that you're a high, I, I know, yeah, I know, yeah, let me tell you, I know how this works, I know how it works, yeah, yeah, you'll get me and I'll say this and Meg will say that and we'll make out and blah, 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 it'll be fine. And uh, in the course of doing it, she was um, tough and she was dogged. Um, at one point, um, I complained about her having to have a meeting with somebody because I'm not going to do it. I'm not making a movie with some kid like that. And she called me up and she said, look, do you not understand how this works? The studio says I have to meet with him, so I met with him. Can you handle that, big boy? Or do you have little wet pants that have you, oh no, I'm not working with him. It's what I have to do in order to get the movie made. Uh, okay, Nora. <laughs> so when we started working, working like that, um, I, it ended up it's that type of thing of I'm going to be tough on you because you don't. I am the boss. Delia and I wrote it, and I want you to do the best work you possibly can. But that doesn't mean just change it. So, no, I became a writer if I can say that. I, I became a writer in this instance. We were doing Sleepless in Seattle. She and Nora had written it. And there was a scene in the movie that came about because of this exchange that I had with Nora and Delia. It was a scene in which the, uh, Ross, my son, uh, didn't want me to go out with somebody because he wanted to meet the lady on the radio and he was, he was angry or, you know, he was pissed off. And they wrote a scene in which the father said, well, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what to do. My son doesn't, uh, I just don't know what to do. And I said, Delia, Nora, are you out of your fucking mind? You think a man who could go off on a date with somebody is going to give a shit that his kid doesn't want him to? Do you, and I said, I literally, do you, do you know, do you know what is going to happen if I go out on a date with this lady little kid? I might get laid. I might get laid. <laughs> and that led into this whole kind of thing. And, and, they, and she and Delia looked at each other and went like. <laughs> <laughs> but I was, the argument that I was making was actually a pretty good one. You know, in that I'm a man. This is men. Sons, and so for my, if you want me to do the best work that I possibly can, I have to bring this up, and I could probably bring it up in a less, you know, kid stupid way, but that's why I brought it up. And when it evolved into something like really ten times better even than that, and when the movie came out, we were talking about it at one point, and Nora said, "Well, you know, you wrote that. You wrote that scene." I said, "I did. I did not write that scene." He said, "No, no, you wrote that scene." I said, "Nora, I complained in rehearsal to you, <laughs> and I ad libbed some baloney that you ended up typing into the script." He said, "No, we did not see that. You did, and you wrote it because Tom. That's what writing is." And from that moment, that's why Nora is the reason that I'm talking to you right now, John. Thank you, Tom. Thank you all.